Testing one, two. Testing one, two. Good morning, Richard. We can listen to you. Hi. Hi, Richard. Good morning. Hi, I, I can hear you now. Yeah, we can hear you too. Thank you. Apologies for that. Oh, no worries, no worries. Right, so we're running 15 minutes late and everything, but... <laughs> This is, as I explained uh, to everybody, this is a normal thing here in Coimbra. So no big deal, just tradition. We must respect tradition, right? So, uh, I'm gonna just share screen here. Uh, how do you do this? Okay, Bruce, can you help me? How do I share my screen? Oops, no. Yeah. Are we in Zoom there? Yeah? Go ahead. Okay. So now. Oh, great. Share okay. screen. Okay. Okay. Wait, uh, I think we we'll take him out of here. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, yeah. great. Okay. So, Richard, can you hear? Can you hear us? Yes. Okay. Great. So, 18 minutes late. 18 minutes late. Diga, nós estamos sem vídeo, ok? So we have no video as per what I was told. Um, yeah. There we go. So you can see this now, right? Hey, Richard. There we go. So hi, Richard. Good morning. Uh, so good morning to all of you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Richard, for joining us uh, remotely. Uh, well, first of all, I would like to, to welcome you all, uh, and especially our guests uh, who are not based in Coimbra, so welcome, and thank you for joining us. Uh, as I've, tell, I've told several people, uh, in Coimbra is a tradition to be 15 minutes late, connected to how our uh, clock at the university was always late, so this is uh, part of the plan, obviously. Uh, and we're going to push the whole program uh, 15 minutes further, so apologies about that. Super quickly, uh, I just wanted to um, to tell you all uh, a little bit about this workshop and how this was assembled. This workshop is called Challenges and Opportunities in Bridging Science and Policy, Policy Making and Identity and Culture Perspectives. It is a partnership between the OICD, the Organization for Identity and Cultural Development, uh, that we have here, the main representative, the uh, president of the organization, who's going to talk a little bit more about it, and the University of Coimbra Institute of Legal Research, which is where we are right now. Uh, this workshop is going to be a, a whole day workshop. Uh, it's being broadcasted live on YouTube. Uh, we begin then at 9.45 and we finish at 7.45. Uh, so uh, Bruce is going to talk about the objectives of the workshop, so I'm not going to do this. If you need anything, if you're interested in getting to know more about the program, you can see in our website. Uh, we are beginning uh, the program today with four presentations on case studies before lunch. Then we're going to have uh, three more and then two specifically on bridging policy and uh, science. And then we end uh, with some discussions. Our sessions are going to be 13 minutes long. Uh, our speakers are going to talk for around 15 minutes and then we have some time uh, for discussion, which I hope is going to be building up during the day. So even though we don't have a lot of time for a uh, speaker to discuss, uh, I hope that we can keep introducing this discussion all, all over the day. Uh, so this is my part. Thank you very much. And I'm passing, uh, I'm passing the floor to Bruce. Thank, Thank you, Bruce. You. Thank you, Joanna. So as Joanna says, a very warm welcome to this workshop. Uh, we're gonna be exploring the intersection between science and policy making with a special focus on identity and culture. This workshop brings together experts from our own network, the Organization for Identity and Cultural Development, and the University of Coimbra's Institute for Legal 
research, which we're in. We are truly an interdisciplinary group, and throughout the day, we're going to be delving in to a series of case studies, each of them designed to shed light on a different realm of social, economic, cultural, and political life. From public health to democracy and governance, from human rights to economic development, from national ethnic policy creation to education, to conflict transformation and the creation of law itself. So a very broad range of sectors we're gonna be covering. At the heart of our conversation, at the heart of this discourse lies the recognition that identity and culture play a pivotal role in shaping policy design and policy outcomes. Our aim is to explore the challenges and potential opportunities that arise when we integrate an understanding of identity factors into bridging research and policy. Collectively, our interdisciplinary approach aims to expose connections between sectors and to highlight the universal principles, things that we can learn across all of these sectors for the creation of research and policy linkages. By doing so, we hope to contribute to the wider conversation about how we can build effective policy more generally, policies which can be transformative through taking a fuller account of the unique needs and aspirations of diverse communities and contexts. So on behalf of the OITD, I'd like to express our deepest gratitude to the Institute for Legal Research in their generous hosting and support of this workshop, to all of our speakers and participants who will generously share their time and expertise, to our audience today and online, and to Richard for joining us from Melbourne, Australia, and to Joanna for her commitment and efforts to organize uh, and bring us all together. So thank you all, and I wish us all a productive and enlightening day. Thank you, Bruce. Okay, so uh, with no further delays, uh, I'm passing the floor now uh, to Richard uh, Chen Hao, Professor of Medical Anthropology in the Melbourne School of Population and Global Health at the University of Melbourne. Richard is going to be talking to us in a hybrid format uh, about incorporating an understanding of minority groups, culture, and lifestyle factors into public health policy. Richard, uh, we would appreciate if you could keep it around 15 minutes so we can have some time to discuss. And thank you very much for uh, joining us. Sure, I will, I will do my best. Hopefully those slides are, are working okay for you. They're okay. Yeah. Yep. Good. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks for uh, ha having me at your event. Sorry that I can't be there in person. Looks like I'm I'm missing out on some great activities, and wish everyone all the best for the rest of the day. I won't be able to hang on, unfortunately, because it's late here. But I hope it all goes well. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm based in Melbourne, uh, in the Melbourne School of Population and Global Health down here at the University of Melbourne. I first met Bruce about, I don't know, 18 years ago and got involved in OICD, probably 17, well, my son is now 17. So he was born about the time I met Bruce. So that's about 17 years ago and have been involved in OICD since then. So wonderful to see everything uh, grown and, and this event today. Um, I would just like to begin by acknowledging that I am zooming in from the traditional unceded lands of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung peoples of the Kulin Nation here in, in Melbourne. And I would like to pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging, and to extend that acknowledgement to any Indigenous colleagues and friends here today. <clears throat> in Australia, it's a, uh, a particularly momentous and somewhat disappointing time in that a few weeks ago, we had a, a referendum around our constitution and an, and an indigenous voice to parliament. We were seeking to change the constitution to recognize um, indigenous peoples in the, in the constitution, but also to put in our constitution uh, an indigenous voice, an indigenous group to parliament that would give their um, advice and opinions directly to Parliament. Unfortunately, uh, our country voted a unanimous no for that um, voice. So it's been a very disappointing and somewhat shameful couple of weeks for, for our country. And uh, much of what I say will sort of underlie a lot of that. Um, I, I kind of, I know I don't have very long and I've probably got longer than I can get through here. So I'll skip through quite a bit. And I wanted to refer us back to a, a Lancet Commission in 2004 
14 on culture and health uh, that uh, that's kind of its fundamental point was that the systematic neglect of culture in health and health care is the single biggest barrier to the advancement of the highest standard of health worldwide. So I want to keep that kind of Lancet Commission forefront in our in our minds. I think we all know what I think the room is is pretty uh, provides a lot of expertise around what what culture is. So I don't need to spend too long in defining what we mean by by culture. Um, there's a definition there from UNESCO, which I won't go into. Um, and I think what what some of the crux of some of the work I do as a, a as a medical anthropologist working in in public health, a lot of the work that we do in public health is around measurement and trying to provide policymakers and organisations good tools and systems to be able to measure health outcomes. Um, and in traditional health impact assessment, policymakers use quite broad and rough. Uh, mortality and morbidity data to inform their recommendations and often there's not a very clear understanding of cultural com contexts that influence uh, individual and societal behaviours and so therefore the re reports and policies that we often get are from statistical evidence they can often be out of step with people's subjective and their own experiences and perceived needs and this doesn't filter through to policy so for example on the right is a kind of a typical public health diagram of the leading causes of Indigenous mortality and the measurements around different aspects of, of ill health, which we, are, we all see too often in, in Australia. Um, there are often attempts to get at the nuances of that of those measurement systems and sometimes that's built around you know, kind of cultures hard to measure so people look at things like well-being um, but often kind of uh, well-being measurements are built on indices that while useful in assessing levels of perceived satisfaction and happiness sometimes they do fall short in illuminating kind of shared meanings and values um, and so in in the absence of a clear understanding of cultural contexts uh, these questionnaires and the responses really fall short and are often just conjectural and are pretty inadequate uh, in, in capturing uh, the health and well-being of, of, of our minority and Indigenous groups. Furthermore, they tend to disempower the groups that we are seeking to measure. Uh, so we, uh, yeah, often vulnerable groups lack opportunities to become involved in, in well-being studies or they feel reluctant to do so, particularly when their situations leave them feeling alienated, um, disempowered. Uh, and so when this is the case, the tools for measuring well-being can actually end up reinforcing power imbalances um, that deny people's voice in decision-making processes that affect their lives. And just our recent events in Australia are a fine example of that. Um, so in order to produce relevant and adaptive health policies and programs, we have to, policymakers and those of us supporting policymakers, have to examine how communities as cultures of practice adjust to diverse and complex stresses. We have to, uh, here measuring inequality becomes impossible without a close assessment of vulnerability and resilience as they emerge locally. And I guess the call out to us in OICD is how can we assist in the development of these more nuanced measures through things like the EMIC method in that OICD champions. Um, you know, at a, at a small level, I've been trying to do this for, for quite a while. There's a, a paper here, if people are interested, around looking at we, we developed with, with friends overseas kind of a self-evaluated quality of life scale around Indigenous people who are engaged in alcohol and drug treatment. And we tried to really try and this was a, a, a work I did some time ago, but it was work trying to develop measures that you could quantify, but would also be qualitative in the sense that they would collect information about people who are in alcohol and drug treatment that they could define the measures that they wanted to report and collect on you would get a quality of life scale at the end of it that was meaningful quantitatively but you also had a qualitative tool and that's a picture of the tool on the left there where you would try and capture things that were most important in people's lives and look at their relative weight and you could use that for sort of program planning but it was very much based on the perspectives of of the individuals using the tools meant to fed through an organization back to policy about kind of areas that are important to kind of clients and programs. Um, 
But there is a danger sometimes of this nuance of trying to provide nuanced qualitative data. We've been working in a community in, in uh, kind of the north of Australia for some time, working on lots of different kind of topics. One particular topic we were working on with the community was around kind of the growth of marijuana use in, in this community where we sort of documented some um, kind of how young people particularly were becoming initiated into marijuana use. We tried to engage the government with the results of our qualitative work, which they pretty much ignored and told us, well, we know all this already. The media picked it up, sensationalised the article that hit the front of the Northern Territory news, you can see there. And after that, that was sort of used amongst other kind of evidence to bring in harsher penalties for trafficking and possession, which wasn't the kind of outcome that we wanted and sort of further disempowered kind of people, but meant, meant there were harsher, polity, uh, harsher penalties for, for drug people who were selling, but it, it wasn't a great news story for the community. So we do have to be aware of how our kind of data is picked up and our well-meaning efforts. Um, there's a really nice article about by a sociologist called Peter Dabbs, who's worked in the north of Australia for a long time, who's written about aligning the policy planets. And he gives an example of an alcohol program that fed into policy that was quite successful for a number of years. And he talks about you need the coalescing of these kind of six different things at the time to make uh, the policy sort of work. So importantly, it did include kind of a fiscal foundation, which is important. Often, you know, we, we come up with these great ideas, but there's no kind of fiscal backing to them. But he talks about a range of different things, both from the industry itself through to kind of political commitment that really was able to provide some success in this example, but eventually it did dismantle. Um, increasingly, at the moment, and we've just got a, a big um, Australian Research Council grant to work with this community, the same community in southeast Arnhem Land, to look at um, kind of social justice, social justice models in public health. And I probably don't have time to go through all, all of these different models, but you know the social justice approaches in public health have been around for a while, and others like Bosch and probably people in the room can comment more expertly than myself, but people like Beauchamp and Rawls have been talking about social justice for a long time, pushing back against kind of market based principles to thinking about kind of a counter ethic in in public health. Um, and particularly, you know, I, I quite like Beauchamp stuff, but Beauchamp says that public health should be a way of doing justice, a way of asserting the value and priority of all human life. And these are his kind of four top tips around how we should incorporate um, uh, social justice perspectives in the way in which we work. Um, I won't go through it because I know we're short of time, um, but he does argue that, that kind of the primary aim of public health should be the elaboration and adoption of a new ethical model or paradigm for public health. Um, and I think people are still, at least in public health, are still talking a, a lot about what does social justice mean. Um, and I, I won't go in. I, go, I won't go into the details of that here. Um, to, to understand, you know, some of the different concepts is important through from Rawls's concept of justice as fairness, um, and that you know we we can't accept that in democratic societies we cannot always guarantee an equal distribution of resources. That hierarchy is inevitable. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we can't have a, a well-ordered, just and equitable kind of society. Um, and he tracks through some different principles that we can think about in social justice. I, I won't cover them here. Um, I quite like the, the um, capabilities approach of Amata Sen and others and thinking about how do you build human capability. Um, so that informs a lot of our work. Um, you know, social justice, I think, is complex and in, in public health, at least, we're just starting to think about social justice approaches. And in this project in southeast Arnhem Land that we're working on, we're very much directed by the, the community and what they want to focus on. Um, here's a map of Australia um, and the community we're working in is sort of up in the middle, right up the top. That's a that's a picture of the over 250 different kind of language groups in Australia that existed before colonisation. Um, and these are the kinds of figures that we get used to in Australia with the big uh, life expectancy gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. Um, it becomes worse the more remote you live in Australia. 
um, disease burden for various kind of diseases that are a lot higher in Indigenous groups. Things like uh, mental health, substance misuse, suicide is, is is a lot higher, but they're the kind of the five leading specific causes of death in Australia. And we have kind of quite advanced quantitative systems for measuring those gaps. And we have a closing the gap report every year that kind of comments on a, a variety of different targets. These are some on the socioeconomic targets, but they're again, quite crude measurements and don't capture some of the things that communities think themselves are quite important. Um, and we've been working in this particular community for a long time. And here's a couple of publications, uh, one book out last year and some other earlier publications where we try and talk about health concerns of, of people themselves. Often people will say, you know, I feel quite, I feel quite healthy. I can get around and see my family, but when they go into the, the, the clinic, they're told they're very unhealthy and at risk of, you know, heart, heart disease, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you know for that community you know they define health in in a, in a different kind of way so we've tried to work to try and capture that um but a recent project that we're working on which they're very keen about is sort of capturing capturing a story about their past and i think you know this is very pertinent at the moment given the disappointing uh result with the voice but um, you know the community sort of said well if we can define our narrative that gives us some sort of empowerment uh, and link to the past and a, and a kind of a way forward to the future. So we've got this sort of new project around this guy called Dexter Jan Daniels and sort of trying to retell his story within the community. Um, and this is his uh, niece that we're working with, managed to get her an honorary doctorate this year, which was great. Um, and she's been sort of champion in the community for a long time, trying to make her community a better place to control kind of the, the, uh, <laughs> the, the power in the, in the community. Um, and this, this particular project, it, we're sort of retelling the story of Dexter, her, her uncle, who was very active in the 1960s, which was a time of great social change in Australia. And Dexter was very much at the forefront of um, that change uh, and he was kind of very instrumental in the whole um, kind of, there was a, a range of protests and walk-offs uh, in Australia that led to uh, sort of native title in, in Australia and, and Dexter was involved in the trade union movement had quite close links to the Socialist Party um, which is interesting because it meant that uh, he had an ASIO file, which we've gone back and sort of read with the community, um, and uh, meant that he, his sort of story has been ostracised from the Australian narrative because of the links to socialism, and nobody really knows about his story anymore. So this project is about kind of rediscovering and retelling his story and his fight for sort of equal rights and justice for Aboriginal people in his own community, but also Australia-wide. And he travelled around Australia, uh, supported by the trade union movement, um, rallying kind of assistance and help and support. Um, and we've been sort of revisioning that in lots of different ways, both by engaging with the archive, you know, going back over his ASIO files, retelling the story with community in community, painting, etc. And so this story is really one about kind of gaining control of the narrative. And that's where we've been trying to support uh, in this project. So I might I might close up there because I know I, we don't have much time per, per speech, but, you know, my 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 main kind of point is that, you know, our in public health, our measurements of, of health uh, are very crude. It's very difficult to get nuanced kind of measurement systems that capture sort of the very lived experience, the lived kind of social determinants of people on the ground. And the work that we're doing now is really much about trying to empower community to, to gain control of their own sort of narratives and who tells, who has the right to tell the story. So I might, I might stop there. And this is a great article, which was written by um, Nancy Krieger a while ago. Um, but if anyone's interested, great, great piece of work. I can't hear anyone, but that's okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
So thank you, Richard. I'm, I'm just trying here uh, an approach in which you can see whoever asks you questions. So I'm joining in with multiple devices uh, and trying not to have a, um, a cacophony of sounds. So uh, thank you very much for uh, for your presentation, for talking to us. It was a very interesting presentation. I'm, uh, with no further delays, I'm going to, uh, to pass the floor to anyone who wants to ask any questions. Um, anybody who would like to say anything? We have a round of applause, but we can start with you. Yeah, we had a round of applause. Yeah, oh, thanks. Have, can you listen to Bruce? Uh, is it I can just hear him if you if you articulate and speak up, I might be able to hear you. Okay, but can you listen to Bruce? Is it working? Uh, the sound? Yeah? Okay, great. Yeah, so, Richard, that was, yeah it's very, very in That's great. Thank you. Oh, thank oh. you. <laughs> uh, so uh, the point that you ended up on there about empowering communities to have control over their narratives um, combines with this point that you made about um, giving measurement tools the ability to have nuance. And I wonder if there's been any exploration that you know of about uh, allowing communities to have control over their own measurement tools or to have some interface with these tools in some way to to make it to them to measure their own uh, uh, statistics, to measure their own uh, values, um, just to put it out there. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, my, there are there are various attempts to kind of get sort of various tools that that people can have some degree of control over. I think it's a it can be a double it can be a double edged sword because communities will often say, you know, just trust us to do what we think is best for our community and we shouldn't have to tell you what we're what we're doing um i, I was involved in a project that was trying to to develop some nuance around kind of measuring health outcomes in, in a community but and, and they wanted to develop a lot of qualitative sort of indicators but it became so enormous um to capture all the nuances that it was you know, to actually do that every year would be a momentous task and sort of digging your own kind of grave in a sense. So often we critique these tools for being overly simplistic, but at the same time, yeah, they're very quick and easy to do and, and to develop some some very nuanced kind of tools that they can be very long and, you know, it, it can be actually an extra kind of burden on a community to comment on each and individual kind of item. So I think sometimes simple is best getting some sort of simple tools that community. I mean, I think the stuff that we did around the self evaluated quality of life stuff was good because people could have con it was very simple. People had could have could have control of it. Um, and that was the key thing you have you have control so you're empowered it's simple it gives a sort of a quantitative outcome but it has some qualitative engagement that you can have discussions around as well but it's it's simple and not doesn't take up a lot of time and um that, in that example it could even take their values of what it means to have, have well-being or health because you're you're asking them that definition as well as measuring. that's right that's right yeah yep absolutely Great. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Uh, anybody wants to ask any other questions? Sure. Yeah, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I was just uh, reflecting on the liberty principle when you said um, one kind of ensuring social justice is establishing uh, this kind of social uh, contracts. So I was wondering, in your case, um, how limiting uh, social contracts are, because if I think about indigenous culture and I think about social contracts in terms of community, I think that if there is no knowledge exchange, it is very homogeneous uh, in the way how the social contracts are built, because maybe some of them have shamans, and then like, this whole thing is like very limiting. So do you foster knowledge exchange, or how do you make sure that these social contracts are actually like heterogeneous? Mm. Yeah, and I think we've had some very kind of good examples of where it's gone terribly wrong in Australia. I mean, the, the interesting thing, after the collapse of the voice referendum a couple of weeks ago, the opposition government declared that we needed to have a, a, a commission, a national commission 
into um, kind of child sexual abuse in communities. And we've seen that before in in Australia where our <laughs> there was sort of under the disguise of sort of a discourse about mutual obligation. Um, it was really about, uh, you know, kind of naming, shaming and, and blaming and uh, disempowering Indigenous communities. So often our kind of uh, social contracts framed under this kind of notion of mutual obligation are used to kind of disempower voices of Aboriginal people. And the intent behind uh, our, our failed referendum was to really try and change that narrative and to ensure that Aboriginal people had a say over the kinds of social contracts that are developed within specific communities. Um, my, I've worked a lot in kind of the alcohol kind of area around alcohol misuse in Aboriginal communities and th that's gone through many different kinds of social contracts and for a time we were involved in the development of alcohol management plans that were very much developed by communities for communities that had kind of uh, very much Aboriginal control over the whole process but you know with change of governments and different government perspectives on how Indigenous policy operates, they tend to kind of change quite a bit. So the, the political framing around it is something that usually brings things unstuck, unfortunately. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm thinking of a model like that I saw in Costa Rica, where they established the health centres and then sent these health workers like, into the villages and they work like, very, like, pers on a personal level. And mm -hmm. like, the Costa Rica the government of Costa Rica could achieve a lot with like, this approach. So I was wondering if this is maybe uh, yeah, an option. And I think. You know, history tells the story because things like we have a, a very vibrant Aboriginal medical service in Australia. So it's Aboriginal, it's an Aboriginal governed, controlled medical services. Um, and they were created by activists, people who wanted to do something for their community, who didn't go to government, who didn't reach out to um, government at all. They just decided to set them set them up themselves to link with, with doctors and other health professionals who are willing to help and government came to the party later. So it, it's really often where, in, and this Dexter Daniel story is the same, it's where Indigenous people have stood up um, and, uh, you know, eventually government has kind of played catch up later on. Um, yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Anybody else? Richard, is there anything else you would like to, to add uh, that you wanted to but didn't have time? No, no, that's that that that's okay. That that's fine for me. I mean, I think this is where you know OICD, you know, is is a really good organization to look at these sort of nuances and as a you know, as Bruce has the emic method, this is what we should be trying to do. And I think trying to empower voices and give control to communities really important in, in that kind of framework. Okay, that's perfect. Thank you. Anybody else? Last, uh, last call? No? Okay, so too early in the morning, okay. Yeah, no worries. Uh, thank you. Richard, thank you very much for your staying with us. I know it's too I'm gonna late. Have, I'm going to have to duck out because I've got kids who are hungry and things, so I've got to go and service uh, all their needs. So I've got to go and do that, but I'll, I'll try and pop back if I can. Thanks, okay, you're welcome. All right. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, so I'm calling now um, to the table Dr. Uh, Sandra Obradovich from the Department of Psychology of the Open University. Sandra, you have a PowerPoint, right? Yes, so I have my phone. So let's just take a quick Oh, oh, it's not already. Oh, sorry, Bruce. She just pop up from the right. Do you want to Please. Yeah, there it is. Just we can copy break, but just for now, we can do this. Yep. 
and I will go back to Zoom. There we go. Okay. Um, great. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sandra Obradovich. I'm a social and political psychologist in the UK. Um, and I work with identity in the context of how it becomes a factor that shapes political attitudes and behaviors, specifically when we think about national identity. So what I'm going to do is very different to Richard, but hopefully the difference will keep people engaged. I'm going to give you an example of how we can read, use identity as a lens to read um, political events that are happening. So focusing specifically on the example of populism and the rise of populism in Europe. And then to kind of take from that what the opportunities and challenges are for policymakers. So, okay, so that's all the same. So if I can move. Okay, just so, so quickly, I so didn't have time to, to listen to your title, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, great, so how do I do this? We're still recording, right? We but are. Yeah. So the first thing I want to do is kind of give you an example. So identity and the rise of populism. And there's been a lot of talk about populism in um, political science and sociology, also in psychology, and there's a lot of discussion about kind of how economic factors are impacting voting, how there's a lot of kind of cultural, you know, this idea of the left behind people revolting and things like that. And there's three points I want to make when I go through this example. So the first is that really what populist movements have successfully done is tap into our human need to belong, and then mobilize that in ways that to some of us might be quite problematic. But they've managed to do that, and I think there's a lesson to be learned from that. The second thing is that it's not just that they're mobilizing people's sense, internal need to kind of belong in their groupishness. They're also positioning these groups in a hierarchy and emphasizing status concerns. So it's not just about saying there's us and there's them. It's about saying there's us and there's them and they're getting more and you're getting less. So it's this relative framework that's really important to keep in mind because we see that populist parties in Europe have managed to both gain support in times of economic decline, which is a narrative that we're more comfortable with or um, that we know better, but also in times of economic prosperity. So it's not just that uh, objective economic decline is always going to fuel kind of this negative exclusionary anti-immigrant sentiments. It can also happen in times of economic prosperity because it's about also both responding to crisis, but also framing crisis. And the last point is, again, it's kind of this idea of political communication and the fact that it mobilizes collective emotions. So if we're framing the world as what's happening to you is not happening to you because you're an individual, but because we're part of a group, then I'm going to elicit certain collective feelings. We are angry. We are afraid. We are under threat. And we are offering you hope. So the first is really this idea of, of kind of the psychology of, of identity and intergroup relations, being at the core of populism, and I would argue being able to be at the core of a lot of political movements. So from psychology, from evolutionary psychology, cultural psychology, focus psychology, we know that humans have a basic need to belong. And the way that this need is kind of addressed is that we socially categorize the world into groups, we position ourselves as belonging to some of these groups, and then we feel part of these groups. So our identities are those, that sense of me, my sense of self that I derive from being part of groups. So if my group is doing well in society, I feel good about myself because my self-esteem is linked to that group. Populism uses these category constructions and positions society in these binaries. There's us and there's them, right? So we live in a world with, I would argue, we have never had as many identity categories as we have accessible to us today, but we're seeing this rise of binaries, which is quite problematic. We're seeing this rise of there's us and there's them. They are the threat. We are the good people and we need to protect ourselves. Now the framing of these intergroup relations can obviously differ. We don't see the same kind of meaning given to us and them across left-wing and right-wing uh, populist contexts. So in right-wing contexts, we tend to see more of this kind of cultural, ethnic, or religious framing. Uh, we see this framing of, you know, we're the good people from this country and we have our elite politicians giving all this money and resources to these new people coming in and they're getting ahead constantly. In left-wing contests, we have more of this economic political framing. Uh, we have this framing of kind of external elites coming in and impacting the politicians of our country and benefiting external forces rather than kind of uh, socioeconomically, socioeconomically um, heterog heterogeneous communities in our world. Now, the implications of this is that there are different ways of constructing who is part of us and who is part of them. But there's some similar features in this kind of frame. 
And that is that we have shared grievances. So this point that I mentioned in the beginning, it's not what's happening to me as an individual, it's something that's happening to me as a member of a group. I am losing out, not because of who I am as a person, not because of where I work or what I do, but because I am a part of this group. That's a very powerful way of mobilizing people. So there's tons of literature in psychology about resistance and discrimination that showed that if we have 10 people in a room that experience the same type of discrimination, they will not act on it. The only time they will act on it is when they talk about it, realize that they're all being discriminated against and realize that it's a collective experience and that mobilizes, right? So framing grievances, framing things that are happening to us from an individual to a group lens has that potential of mobilizing. Now, what that means is if we're losing, someone else is gaining. It's this kind of, again, this binary mindset that means that who is the scapegoat? Who is the other that is problematizing and taking away from what's rightfully mine? And as we know with populist movements, there's this anti-establishment sentiment that's developed as well. The elites are favoring these people who are ruining our lives. They're giving benefits to people who are not as hardworking as I am. And so there's this kind of metaphor of being squeezed in the middle, right? The good people in the middle sit between the elites that are favoring these people at the bottom, and those of us who are trying to be good people get squeezed and we lose out. Now, what happens in these situations is that leaders, political leaders, emerge as entrepreneurs of identity. So they emerge and they say, you know what, I get it. We're losing out. We're not getting all these things. I'm here for you. I value what you value. I am a part of your group. And social psychology literature tells us that what this does is that if a leader comes into a group context and says, I embody everything that you value, I embody everything that you want, they become a prototype of that group, right? They become the prototypical in-group leader because they embody all of these values that are important to us and they say, and I have a solution. So this um, point about uh, populism also flourishing in times of economic prosperity comes from the ability of these entrepreneurs of identity to tap into relative deprivation. So it's not that I objectively am losing. The country's GDP is on the rise, unemployment is decreasing, and yet none of those benefits are going to me. There's a sense of relative deprivation. It's not that we are all doing better as a society, it's that some people are doing better than me. And why is that the case? So. Right. The second point then comes to this idea of status, right? And this idea of relative deprivation relates to losing out in relation to other people. I have less than you. Why is that? If it's framed in group terms, then it's positioning us and them in a hierarchy, right? And we have a very kind of innate need for fairness and innate need for our status concerns to be addressed. So any indication that our status is being lost or is under threat, can have a really big impact on how we react, right? So this idea of us and them becomes positioned in a hierarchy. It's not a society with a lot of diversity and different groups. It's a society where different social categories are positioned on a ladder. And it's the perception that your level on that ladder is decreasing. So when we perceive a sense of lowering of status or even a perception that in the future, we're gonna lose status. So it might not be today, but it will be in the future, that triggers a sense of low power and a sense of low control. And what do we do as individuals? We look to fulfill that need to address that loss through our groups. So groups become ways to remedy this, right? So I don't. I feel a sense of power, a loss of power, a loss of control. Where can I regain that? You can regain that through affiliating yourself with your groups, through strengthening those ties, and through mobilizing through the group rather than as an individual. And we find continuously that this idea of kind of social comparison, negative social comparison and relative deprivation is a key trigger for support for right-wing populist parties. And again, even in countries where economic prosperity is on the rise and we see a reduction in, in immigration sentiment. So the point I really wanna make is that it's not always what's objectively happening, but it's about how we're perceiving things that really matters. And that's where these politicians as entrepreneurs of identity play a really key role. So an identity framing of political support moves us beyond this idea of framing populism as either an economic or cultural question. Is it because we have economic decline 
that populism is on the right? Is it because we have the culturally left behind? And an identity framing would say, actually, it's not about either or, it's about how one operates through the other. It's about how we can use changes in economic circumstances to frame them as being about cultural or social groups. About saying that economic, we have economic prosperity in the country, but your group, your cultural or your social group is not benefiting from that. And so this kind of preoccupation with status and our need for fairness and our need for um, control can be mobilized through this discourse of saying, you're losing out, your group is losing, and it's because you are of this group, ethnic, religious, racial, social, whatever it might be. It's not an objective thing. It's a very subjective thing, right? Now, what happens in these situations is if, if these entrepreneurs of identity are able to construct a crisis narrative, they're also able to offer solutions, right? So I would argue, and there is some literature to support this, that strong leaders don't only emerge in times of crisis, they also construct a crisis. And when they construct a crisis, they can offer you alternatives. And so there's an there's a importance of considering the interface between identities and emotions, right? Emotions can drive voters. So we see that there are emotions that mobilize and emotions that demobilize. So emotions like feeling resentment, feeling anger, feeling threat, feeling fear, these are mobilizing emotions. These will get people out into the street to vote, to protest. But then there are also demobilizing emotions, helplessness, loneliness, exclusion. These can be emotions that demobilize and make you feel like there's nothing you can do about it. What's equally important, but that we don't focus on, is the positive emotions, okay? A lot of times when we look at political movements, there's a lot of kind of fueling of anger and resentment and hate. But within the context of that, that is directed at the other, right? That is directed at the other and the injustice that you are suffering. But what's offered in terms of positive emotions is positive emotions for you and your group. You are suffering, but you're good people. You don't deserve this, you know? And what this does for people who are experiencing this perceived loss is it gives them a positive sense of self. It makes them say, yeah, you know what? It's not my fault. Actually, I'm a good person. And this, people, this person speaks to that. They're tapping into those positive emotions. So what we have there is this emphasis on collective hope future can be better, the future can be different, but also the affirming of a positive identity, which for a lot of people we were told that they are, you know, behind the times, they have their wrong values, they're not progressive. Someone comes and tells, actually, you're a good person. You're part of a good group. So through kind of mobilizing these emotions, we also see that these leaders are able to affirm an English identity that's positive. And that has really strong implications for voters who feel marginalized, who feel excluded, and who feel that the benefits that are being developed in their socio-political environment are not going to that. They're not participating in it. So seeing populism, I would argue, through an identity lens, we can understand how populist voting is driven by this kind of parochial desire to help your community when it's perceived to be under threat. So I think it's important in these discussions to not just say these are irrational voters, these are stupid people, but to understand what are the underlying psychological needs that these movements meet and fulfill. And the question then becomes, how can we harness that in policy, right? How can we harness that in ways to move it in directions and towards goals that we think are productive, right? There's a normative claim here. I fully accept that. And it's one that we can discuss. So what does this tell us about democracy and voting and identity in the context of that? And I'll take two minutes to talk about that. The first thing is I think the challenges for policymakers. Identities are incredibly complex. And as Richard was talking about this kind of the importance of bringing nuance into measurement, that equally features as a question here. How can policy capture the complexity of identity? What we see being used is these identity binaries, right? Us and them, win or lose, in or out. And this oversimplifying the sociocultural and political landscape that we live in. The other challenge, I think, is that identities are often weaponized in political discourse. And this is something that the OICD talks a lot about. So how do we break down the perpetu perpetuation of binaries? How do we break down, down the perpetuation of this idea that you as a group are losing, these people are to blame, this is how we now understand the world and the social landscape. It doesn't matter that immigration numbers are going down. 
in matters that I perceive them to be going on, right? So we got to move beyond this idea that truth and facts will get people on the right path. They won't. Continuously research shows that they won't. So what can we do? We need to harness essentially how people's perceptions shape their understandings of the world and the role that identity plays in them. Another thing that I think is important is this idea that populist movements often mobilize identities against. How do we mobilize identities for, right? Identities can both unite and divide, but if we're framing them as people coming together against something, it's inherently kind of in this framework of, of against others. There's a threat. How do we mobilize identities for? For values that we believe in, for beliefs that are important, for behaviors that are productive to society. So those are three challenges that I would pose. I would say the opportunities for policymakers lay in the fact that identity, identities are here to stay. So we can't ignore them, we have to engage with them. Um, they meet many of our psychological needs and recognizing this can enable us to promote well-being as part of democratic life rather than separate to it. Identities also mobilize. Like I said, research on discrimination shows if 10 people have the same experience but don't share it, they do not mobilize. If they share it and come together as a group, that mobilizes. So identities inherently as the kind of outcome of social categorization and groupishness mobilizes people to take action. We see that through protests, we see that through voter turnout. And so how can we harness the positive power of identities and channel it into productive outcomes? The first step I would say, and I'm happy to take your thoughts on this, is that we need to move away from these binary identity weaponizations. We need to move away from a language that positions identities in a framework of either or. You or me, us or them, winning or losing, threat, non-threat. This is really problematic because it oversimplifies and it also oversimplifies how we view the world, but also the options we have to navigate the world and the choices we can make for the world. So I think I'm slightly over time, so I will stop there, but I look forward to hearing your thoughts on this thing. Thank you very much, Sandra. Uh, we have any questions? Uh, my question is how many aspects of your presentation that distinguish between left wing and right wing populism? My understanding is populism the term I don't think is really that to yeah. matter, even though we don't use it. Yeah. This is not an image of people, but yeah. I think it's it's inherently anti-elite. Mm -hmm. Whether it's left wing like in the US Bernie Sanders or right wing Trump. And I think that's true across the, the countries. So how how persuasive is the empirical foundation for that distinction between left wing and right wing made? Or is it possible that this cultural economic dynamic you talked about is offered from both sides, all sides of the spectrum? And the point is that they can both be weaponized for whatever demagogic leader like the you know the Slovakian leader or the Polish leader, you've got left-wing and right-wing national populist authoritarians. Yeah. Using the same technique to mobilize identity in their interest versus the popular interest. Yeah. yeah. No, it's a good question, and I think it's it's an important one. What a lot of the kind of political science literature on, on populism has tended to argue is that populism is this thin-centered ideology, right? It's the, it's the kind of way of perceiving the world that then is given meaning through the ideology that it's attached to. So if so, this these elements of scapegoating of shared grievances and anti-establishment take different forms depending on the broader ideology ideology they become attached to, whether that's right wing or left wing. I think that it still matters, regardless of which one it is, that socioeconomic grievances get framed in cultural terms. It just is a different kind of understanding of of cultural terms, right? So in countries like Sweden, it's an ethno-nationalist framework. It's saying ethnic Swedes are losing out to all of the immigrants that are coming. Um, and whereas in other countries that are more left-leaning, it's not necessarily about cultural groups in that regard. It's about maybe socioeconomic conditions being perceived in relation to minorities, but also poor people. And so uniting much more across low-power groups than we see in right-wing movements, where it's actually uniting some of the poorest and some of the richest. 
right? You get a lot of kind of right-wing support among wealthy people because there's that anxiety that comes from, you know, actually having a lot of money and having prosperity leads to this anxiety that it might be lost in the future. And so that's what's being triggered for them. For some people, it's an objective reality that you don't, you're, you don't have power, you don't have economic power and or political power. But for others, it's this trigger that you might lose it in the future. Yeah, I don't know if that answers it. But... Thank you, Sarah. Anybody else? Yeah. yeah. Hello. Thank you so much for your presentation and and I would be interested in the rights of the Great Society at the Center for Social Research and I do this research center at the University of Canada. And I'm really triggered because I'm researching migration as uh, willing to conduct ethnographic research mm -hmm. with migrants and and my question is, um, well, you, you left this uh, open question on mm -hmm. what I did for, but in a way, I'd, I'd like to return it to you. Yeah. Uh, I like to, but I believe it's a concern for neutrality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you say concern for neutrality, what do you mean? It seems to point back. Uh, it seems to point towards the, okay. Uh, my approach it would be deconstructing binary mm -hmm. understanding yeah. of the world, right? But in a sense, I think, or I perceive this uh, risk of a kind of neutrality policy mm -hmm. with uh, Switzerland, right. diplomatic approach to not committing. Right. Which I found also of concern. Yeah. Okay. I see what you mean. It's a fair question. And we were talking about this yesterday. And I, um, there's this question of, of identity has definitely been mobilized much more successfully by political movements that I normatively don't agree with. Right. So if I think that I identify as someone that's left wing, I would say that identity is something that hasn't been successfully mobilized, something that feeds our psychological need to belong. Right. So how are certain movements able to mobilize much more those needs that people have than others? And I think we have to acknowledge the power that identity holds. It doesn't necessarily mean that we then say the only way to successfully harness it is to pick groups against each other. I don't think, I think that's what some movements have successfully done and shown, but I think there are other ways to think about it, right? There are ways to maybe identify and frame the in-group around shared goals that are accessible to everyone, but that are not defined in relation to whether you're born here or not, right? So there's some literature that shows that this has been successful, but it's successful to the extent that there are equal power dynamics between the members of that group, right? Because otherwise, what you're gonna have is we have a shared goal, but not everyone has the capacity to enact the goal, to have an opinion on the goal, uh, and to support the goal, right? So you then have these higher, so I think the problem is this perception of, of power and hierarchy, even within intra-groups. You know, so the, the idea of the European Union project is a great one. There's this idea that everyone can, belongs to Europe and we all can identify as European. But if you ask most people in Central Eastern Europe or in kind of candidate member states, they would say that the most European country is Germany. So if that's the goal, if we should all become German, then that's very threatening to countries in Central Eastern Europe or Southeastern Europe who have different values, who have different goals. And so I think the key thing is that we can come together. Shared identities don't have to be constructed based on demographics. They can be based around goals. But within those goals, there needs to be an equal power structure. And that's oftentimes not really achieved. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, but I would say that the, it's difficult to, I don't think neutrality is a goal to strive for. Um, I think it's just acknowledging that within a group you can have diversity, but that diversity needs to exist on an equal power basis. And that's an issue that we don't tackle often. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to comment on that. Um, I'm here from North Europe, and uh, we probably mentioned just right now, yeah. we are a political party that stands for this pan European, right? Yeah. So if you bring this example, I would like to make a counter uh, suggestion. I think that. Um, what you mentioned about this threat of being neutral, I think it's not about 
um, focusing on, uh, okay, not shooting, it's maybe more of removing bias thinking, mm -hmm. because this is what we are all doing in the end, we're always like thinking very mm -hmm. biased, and I think we should focus on how can we remove this behavior, and it starts like um, every now and now, it starts with hiring process and companies, so, um, and I think we all can do something for it, um, so, yeah, and the only question that I will give to you back to you is um, what do you think about, for example, here in Portugal, uh, observe a lot, okay, uh, we have Portuguese and then we have the Brazilians and there is a lot of bias thinking. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, oftentimes these minority groups, in order to protect themselves, they kind of seem to support their own bias. So I was wondering what we can do against that, that they don't like try to protect themselves, supporting their own stigma. Mm -hmm. It's a good question. I think the, uh, the point of bias is interesting because we're very quick to point out that everyone else is biased and we're not, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's the first thing that all human thinking is biased. There's, in my opinion, there's nothing that's ever non-biased thinking. Rational individual thinking is extremely flawed. So we all have biases, we all use these heuristics, we all use cognitive shortcuts because we're cognitively overloaded, especially nowadays with technology, with digital tools constantly having, you know, everything's competing for our attention. And so that kind of quick instant bias reaction is more and more common and it's across the board. It doesn't matter who you want and how you identify. So I think definitely that kind of emphasis on slow thinking is really important. The emphasis of not kind of reacting instinctively, but slowing down our own thinking. So one a really good example of kind of an exercise to do is, in the context of policy making is engaging in mechanistic thinking. So you say you are anti-immigration and you support a particular policy. Can you, in a mechanistic way, explain how your opinion on this policy and how this policy will achieve the outcome that you want? And in most cases, when we sit down and try to think through our positions on policies in a step-by-step -step manner, we realize that our understanding is, is an illusion. We don't actually understand how these things work. And so that's a really good moment of self-reflection to think, okay, one, maybe, so where are my opinions on this coming from, right? It's oftentimes from groups, but also how can I learn more about it? Um, so I think that in, in a lot of my other work where I look at kind of political education and, and political dialogue, I think that our group context, intra-group context, where we're with like-minded others, are really good spaces and opportunities to start to challenge these biases. A lot of interventions focus very much on meeting people, having one person that is right-wing meet with someone that's left-wing and have them trying to understand each other, right? But I think that most of our conversations about pressing political issues don't happen across divides. It happens within, right? So those are the spaces I think we need to tackle. We need to, when you say something biased and we're part of the same group, I need to counter that. I need to challenge that. Mm -hmm. The problem is that that threatens our social bond. And so we don't do that. But do you think policymakers can like become some kind of control uh, team? Like, let's say if we have a dialogue that there is like a third party basically or a third instance that is like operating at the control of all the dialogue in order to maybe prevent it. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's definitely been a lot of kind of research on deliberative democracy shows that the presence of a moderator can always help to create and kind of facilitate better dialogue. Um, I think that there's always a question of identity labels there, too. If you're coming in from a particular political party and you say, I'm going to moderate this discussion, I'm going to look at you and think, well, you're not really. You want it to go a particular direction. So I think there's it's very difficult uh, one really interesting thing I always find to do is give people a political quote, and the first thing they say is, who said that? Mm -hmm. So I need to position this according to who said this. Was it right, right, right wing, left wing? Was it a party I agree with or not agree with? And then I evaluate the information. So we use identity a lot to kind of essentially bias our thinking when we receive information. Um, I think what policymakers can do is kind of work on this, firstly work on, on identity literacy because I think in a lot of policy documents, we can inadvertently exclude identity groups or social categories through the language that we use. So this idea of the countering the binary. I think there's also scope for them thinking about how we can bring in slow thinking. Policymakers, like everyone else, are overloaded with information, with tools, with you know constraints on what they can do and resources. So I think we, gotta, we have to start small. 
and building the identity literacy, I think, is one way to do that. Yeah, I think that's very so. Uh, I just suggest that we continue this conversation during coffee break so we can try to keep up with time. I guess we have another person trying to, to ask. No, I'm sorry, I need to cut this short. No, no, no. I'm not going to six times. Kind of oh, yeah. It's just not to polarize it into between people. So I'm taking this last question, okay? And then uh, uh, we move into coffee break and then we can continue to set the great coffee break uh, and drink those cheese. Okay, yeah, thank you. Sorry. And I'm, I'm focusing my, my research on the religious identity, the conflicted religious identity. Right. And I believe that this is a very strong case for this uh, positive uh, uh, engagement of identity. Because, uh, it has been tried the solution of neutrality among yeah. the religious yeah. uh, and it didn't yeah. work at all. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but it, it, now in the, the latest uh, tendencies of, of a religious service, uh, it's, it's about religion in a non, uh, uh, in, a, in a more green way and the, the, the attempt to uh, to to address religion identity on its foundations, and to to try to reach me, uh, one of the concepts that that's been very much uh, up to date in the this the discussion is mm -hmm. yeah. It's a, a huge concept in all major um, religions. And it brings many, uh, many interesting uh, ways of permitting an interface communication of identities mm -hmm. among the differences that, that are that exist yeah. and will always exist. But it's a very interesting way of promoting not only uh, the, the the identity of and the foundation of each one of the religions, but also to find the meeting points yeah. of all the religions in that same foundation. Yeah. And it's very interesting to, uh, to look at because it's a good example of this uh, identity congregation efforts to bring the identity to, to, this, to this core and to the cooperation, not into the binary. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, it's a good example. And there's a lot of kind of interventions in, in conflict and post conflict societies that do exactly that, right? So they bring mothers together from the different sides or from different groups to say, look, you're, you're all mothers. You share the same worries and fears for your children. It, you know, so it's, it's kind of appealing to these things that sit beyond identities. You know, there's certain values that we might frame in different ways, but we all hold across groups. So I think it's a good way to also break down these boundaries and barriers to say, yes, you might be different in this one way, but look how you're similar in this way. And they're not mutually exclusive. You don't have to be either fully the same or fully different. So I think that's a great example. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll keep that comment short because I know we've run over time. So thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. So thank you all for your questions and engagement. Uh, I do like the debate and I'm very flexible in the sense. Uh, but let's just try to to keep things uh, uh, to little uh, a little bit closer to the problem. So we're gonna have a coffee break now. It's uh, outside over here. We can continue discussing during coffee break. We were supposed to have half an hour of a coffee break, but uh, I think that we can keep it a little bit shorter uh, and come back maybe uh, at uh, uh, eleven twenty. So we, we try to recover uh, five minutes out of our program and have more time to discuss. Uh, so yeah, see you, see you all in a short while. Thank you.
Okay, so uh, I hope the discussion during COVID break was uh, productive. Uh, welcome back again. Um, so before I continue and before I call uh, Mr. Chipfit to, to the floor, uh, I'd just like to, to ask you something. Uh, I'm going to, to create a, a Word document uh, using my iPad, uh, this one. So uh, whoever wants to be included in a, in a list of emails uh, to continue this conversation and to be invited into other uh, workshops and initiatives connected to the OICD, I would please mm -hmm. ask you to, to write down your name, uh, institution and email so that we can uh, keep this uh, and, uh, and continue our conversation. Okay, so I'm gonna do this in a short while. So um, I think we managed a little bit to uh, recover part of our time. Uh, thank you all for that. Uh, so I'm going to invite here uh, Chip Fitz from the Stanford Law Center. <laughs> thank you, Chip. So Chip is going to talk about uh, incorporating identity factors into human rights, advocacy, and privacy law and policy which is uh, one of the very much important topics for us here at the University of Cambridge Center for Legal Research. So thank you very much to, to be with us, uh, for being with us, uh, and uh, I'll give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for hosting us in such an excellent fashion. Thank you to the Institute and to uh, for organizing this, this workshop, which has been fascinating already. So I'll try to not uh, lower the quality too much <laughs> in my remarks. Um, Try to speak, speak up a bit. I think it's working very well. But okay. Is there a microphone in particular? Or is it? This is the microphone. Okay. So I just project. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Um, you've heard some excellent points this morning about the role of identity factors in public health from Richard, um, in voting in democracy from Sandra. Um, I also want to just mention the aspect of climate change, just a sentence or two, because climate change is the greatest chronic threat, of course, to uh, planetary existence and health and to the health of many nations. Uh, literally life or death issues, it's not happening in the future, it's happening now. It implicates also a lot of human rights issues. You know, the right to an adequate standard of living, which is in the economic, social, cultural uh, covenant, the, one of the two major treaties in this area. Also non-discrimination, which is a common obligation between that covenant and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights both of which stem from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights after World War II that Eleanor Roosevelt and philosophers and politicians from all over the world, it was truly universal. It's become only more so because it's been ratified so often. And it's now, uh, as it says in, in the document, a common standard of achievement for humanity. Um, environmental, the right to a clean environmental uh, you know, environment is, is a new right that has been recently approved uh, just recent. So we also, of course, have overlaps between human rights and humanitarian law, which are very much at issue uh, and are affected by identity factors. I'll just briefly um, talk about some of the, for those of you that haven't studied human rights, I know that some of you have. <laughs> we were talking about it during the coffee break. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about the idea that identity is at the core of human rights not in the subsets of different identities, but in the fact that we all have human rights merely as a result of our identity as humans, right? And then you do get into specific identities that are protected by specific treaties. In addition to the Universal Declaration, in addition to the two covenants I mentioned, civil and political, economic, social, cultural, mm -hmm. uh, which were divided, by the way, because of the Cold, Cold War. The Soviet Union and the US didn't agree on one treaty. Otherwise, we would have had an integrated treaty implementing and operationalizing Universal Declaration. But we actually have specific, uh, in common Article Two of those two treaties, specific anti-discrimination provisions against grounds or identity factors such as race or color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth, or other status. And that's now been added with uh, conditions such as disabilities in the new Disabilities Convention or Indigenous Peoples with the Declaration on Indigenous Peoples, the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Peoples that preceded that. Um, so the point is that there are specific identity issues, but there's this common non-discrimination piece that protects all of our identities against discrimination and provides for equality before the law. 
and avoids maltreatment, right? Human rights abuses on those grounds. There are also some specific treaties that have means of protecting those identities. If you think about, for example, the Convention Against Torture, it's to avoid your being tortured because of your identity condition as a dissident or a journalist or political opponent or a soldier in war or a non-governmental group like Hamas that is conducting war. You're not supposed to be tortured and you're not supposed to torture others. So there are also other treaties that provide means of protecting identities, like the right to seek asylum from persecution, which is in the International Covenant of Civil Political Rights. It's also in the 1950s Refugee Convention. Um, so just think about that. You've got the means, and you've also got these specific treaties that protect things like the Convention Against Racial Discrimination, the Convention Against Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, right? Um, you've got conventions like the Convention Against Enforced Disappearances, um, the Migrant Workers Convention, a Convention on the Rights of the Child, a Convention, as I mentioned, on Persons with Disabilities, Indigenous people, minorities. The point is that we have these broad overarching provisions against discrimination, plus as needed to protect vulnerable groups. And that's a core human rights issue is that human rights puts its thumb on the scale for vulnerable groups, especially, you know, discrete and insular minorities that are at risk, like women are at risk in war. Children, as we've seen very dramatically in the last month, are very much at risk in war. Now, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about, uh, you know, this negative and positive aspect. There's the protective aspect, but of course, these, these treaties also advance empowerment. Um, Article 26 of the Universal Declaration, and this is relevant to our workshop here and also OICD's work, it says that in essence, education shall be directed to the full development of the human personality. It's a very positive, uh, uh, affirmative obligation and to the strengthening of respect for human rights. So protection and development of identity and, and human rights are linked right there in that article. And of course, OICD is an educational as well as a, uh, an identity development and culturally protecting organization. The, that article continues, shall promote understanding, tolerance, and friendship among all nations, racial and religious groups. So in that one article, it also concludes peace, peace in accordance with the aims of the United Nations. So all of these are consistent with OICD's aims. They're also what we're seeing violated when we see, as Sandra was talking about, the weaponization of identity factors for private interest of staying in power, corrupt interest of making more money. These leaders that want access to resources and benefits and, and their selfish interests as opposed to the common good. Um, I decided last night to talk not so much about privacy in particular, although I will return at the end to artificial intelligence and how it's making all of these problems worse. I mean, it has great potential benefits for humankind. But, you know, the current war between Israel and Hamas, I think given the topic of the workshop, I think we would be negligent if we didn't talk a little bit about human rights and identity factors in that war. Because like all wars, they're not just about resources. At core, they're really often about, and the wars today are often about, like the major war in Russia and Ukraine, the war between Hamas and, and Palestine, Palestine. If you think about it for a moment, you realize just how central identity is, right? You've got the historical narratives, sadly, as I discovered, you know, 30 years ago, I think it was, at the World Conference Against Racism in Durban, South Africa, I heard the Israelis and the Palestinians shouting at each other, their selection of facts and their narratives were totally non-intersecting. You know, and if you hear what you're hearing on the media today, you've got non-intersecting stories and histories and narratives that demonize the other. This is the other thing that's so concerning right now. The massive, dramatic, persistent dehumanization of each side by the other. I mean, we've watched this conflict, right, for decades. It's been one of the central conflicts of the global order. And yet the level of dehumanization now, I think is worse even than for our wars. It's just unremit, un unrelenting. And that of course is a prerequisite to some of the worst human rights violations. They tend to occur in times of war, but you've also got ethnic cleansing and genocide considerations. And despite it being said after the Holocaust, uh, you know, in, during World War II, that this would never happen again. We've seen it happen yet, right? In other genocides, Rwanda and Cambodia and so forth. And there are 
you know, their, their factors going on. My point is that the current Russian imperial aggression, they're asserting their great power status and their history as a great empire versus Ukraine's independent identity, that is clearly an identity war, right? And similarly, the possible conflict between China, its imperial aim, its nine dash line, asserting, you know, uh, as a, what they interpret as their narrative history, their right to control the seas, even within the exclusive economic zone that's set out by the law of the sea treaty, you know, their possible conflict versus an independent Taiwan that wants to maintain its identities. In fact, at its core, these are identity factors. Am I not speaking right now? Boy. Okay. So it's vital for all of us, not just combatants, but everyone in this room and the people you know, and diplomats, politicians, leaders, civil society organizations, to ask the a, a really fundamental identity question is, who are we? What are our fundamental values? Can we defend this? I mean, you see what's happened over the last month, and it's just hard to imagine that this is in any way consonant with not just human rights, but basic humanity. The Universal Declaration talks about how we're all, uh, you know, born equal with respect and dignity as our inherent right as humans. That's how we get human rights. And yet now we're seeing, you know, normalized collective punishment, right, on both sides. On October 7th, as Hamas was killing a lot of innocent civilians, including, you know, babies and Holocaust survive, survivors, elderly people, families, entire families. You're also, of course, seeing it with the siege of Gaza, which itself is, you know, the, the UN has said at this point, because they haven't gathered all the evidence, but the evidence is there. The satellite imagery alone, looking at, you know, the dense, difficult, but living conditions in Gaza versus the parking lots that you're now seeing over the last month. You know, over 10,000 killed, according to the Palestinian Health Authority, which has been dismissed badly even by the president of my home country, the United States. I don't I'm not sure I believe those statistics are the Palestinians. Blissfully unaware that our State Department has relied on them you know, forever, and that so do all the international agencies, so do the NGOs, the health and medicine NGOs. You know, so it's it's really, you know, these statistics are published with a detailed identity register, ID number, names, you know, the, the identity is quite verifiable of the Palestinians that have been killed, uh, you know, in response to what happened on October 7th. Collective punishment is a war crime, and yet it's happened historically in this, in this region. The medieval type siege with prolonged denial of basic essentials that are protected under the Economic Social Rights Covenant, for example, things like food, water, internet, uh, fuel, medicine, humanitarian assistance, things like the forced displacement, and of course, the indiscriminate bombing at massive scale. Even if Hamas builds uh, tunnels under a hospital or refugee camps, the norm of civilian protection is dominant in international humanitarian law. You cannot just bomb civilians. Uh, there's there's a limited amount of collateral damage that's acceptable if there's you know a, a justification based on the importance of the military objective. But you can't take you know your desire to kill one terrorist as an excuse to kill a hundred people in a hospital or thousands of people, which has happened. That and that's why. The UN Secretary General, all of these agencies have said, you know, if this continues, they're, they're being tentative in their in their pre-evidentiary status, but they're they're saying this this is possible war crime. Um, why? Well, Universal Declaration of Human Rights again, Article Three. Everyone, and of course, including women and children, everyone has a right to life, liberty, and security of person. All right. And the tragically evident murderous intent on both sides is evidence of criminal activity, you know, international violations of law. There are even issues of ethnic cleansing and ironically genocide in this conflict that have already arisen with, of course, the Hamas charter committed to the destruction of Israel and Jews and repeated rhetoric from, you know, Israeli ministers and Netanyahu himself Last week, he invoked 1 Samuel 15, 3, quote, now go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. 
put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. So we have this absurd paradox that civilian murders are somehow an okay response to murders of civilians. We have this absurd paradox, a debate over opening a humanitarian corridor or having a pause when that need comes from a siege that Israel imposed. It's really sort of Kafkaesque, right? If you think about it for even a moment again. This sort of thing cannot be normalized again. It's imperative for us and for the governance and institutions of the world, these agencies, to resist the normalization of what's happening. As Israelis know better than most, we have to claw back some respect for the rule of law, humanitarian law, human rights, some restored boundaries of decency as a matter of identity. Remember our common humanity. Search for literally, in this case, common ground, right? As opposed to these mutually destructive, revenge-laden ideologies that have underlain this, these repeated cycles of violence um, for the, the last 70 years, really. It's going to be crucial also as a practical matter to strategic resolution of the conflict. Without that, we're going to see more and more loss of popular support, allies, resources. Um, even President Biden referenced the flawed experience of the U.S. post 9-11, where the U.S. overreacted in, in, in revenge without any evidence of a tie between Saddam Hussein and, and Al-Qaeda or evidence of weapons of mass destruction. We'll likewise, if this continues, see more, and I'm very concerned about spreading instability, escalation. This could go nuclear within 24 hours, right? If you have a bombing uh, by His Hezbollah of some of the 150,000, 200,000 rockets they have, the Iron Dome, despite its amazing defensive capabilities for Israel, would not prevent that. And the response could very rapidly escalate into involvement of regional powers. We'll see more forced migration, growing stress on economies. Right now, it's already happening. Tourism is, is going to continue to be down. Economic, social, cultural rights, workers will be uh, will continue to see their livelihoods threatened. Weakened society and civil rights groups subject to even more surveillance and authoritarianism using new technologies of control that I'll return to when I touch on uh, artificial intelligence. The point is that ID, identity itself, quite obviously in this conflict, very vividly, can and frequently does determine whether your human rights and even your life will be respected. Uh, we can even see that, you know. Are you a member of another tribe? Or are you dehumanized? Are you a member of a minority group who can be repressed or exploited or ignored? A journalist or a human rights defender who are at great risk, not only in this conflict, but around the world routinely. Are you, uh, as a journalist, are you able to be considered an enemy of the people, right? And attacked and even killed, as happened with this famous Palestinian-American journalist, Shireen Abu Akhle, who was shot in the West Bank last year by an Israeli soldier. Israel denied it, and then reluctantly, after these independent investigations from different authorities, had to admit, well, it, it's, it's possible. 68 journalists were killed last year during the entire year, according to the Committee to Protect Journalists. 35 thus far, probably more than that, this was a few days ago, 35 just in the last month in this particular conflict between Israel and Hamas. So it's an identity-based, us-first mentality, right? Like the America First movement historically that Bruce was telling me about when he's reading Rachel Maddow's new book, um, it goes into that fascist history in America that fortunately was, was defeated. It's sort of like the post 9-11 era when George W. Bush said, you're with us or you're against us. It's reinforced by those long-standing non-intersecting narratives with different selections of facts. It's reinforced by language and symbols as OICD examines in a very impressive scholarly evidence-based manner in its methodology looks at. So what should policy do? Well, as Sandra was suggesting, policy should avoid these us versus them triggers. So when we're talking about this, do not start with the sort of things I could say. You know, don't, don't invoke the us versus them dichotomies. Start by listening very respectfully and humbly. Let them get their stories out. This requires a collective identity intelligence, an emotional intelligence, a cultural intelligence of the sort that OICD specializes in. 
and that we all need in this terms of poly crisis, because not just this war, but all elements of the poly crisis, obviously the pandemic, which a lot of people didn't get vaccinations because it was some conspiracy theory, right? Bill Gates putting chips in you or, or whatever. Same thing with, um, you know, you'll hear, you'll hear from Tassos in a minute about the SDGs and how there have been regression of that, in part because of the pandemic, in part because of other issues. Um, but, you know, the point is we have to avoid sort of own goals by triggering people. And we need to look for those, those possibilities of common ground, the positive visions that Sandra was talking about. And that's certainly difficult, but very much needed in this conflict. It's hard to even imagine that happening, but there is not going to be a military solution to this conflict. It can only happen, peace always only happens really, with you know the sort of you know, buy-in, otherwise you're gonna have continued resistance. I mean, the sort of buy-in that they had in the Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland that resulted in the end to the trouble despite you know spurts of violence and upsurges. It's nothing like it was when I was a child up and hearing about it. Um, otherwise, you know, we're going to continue to have, continue to hate crimes, anti-Semitic and Islamophobic against Jews. It's happening in Northern African countries, in Europe, and Tunisia, and, and in the U.S. This horrible, uh, you know, six-year-old boy who was stabbed over a couple of dozen times in Chicago by a man who had been radicalized by listening to right-wing talk radio. In my view, in Amnesty's view, I work with Amnesty International and other NGOs, uh, they're calling for a ceasefire, as are a lot of the medical organizations, as are things like Save the Children and Care. That's the only way we can stop the ongoing slaughter that's just appalling that we're seeing right now. Um, so I think that big policy solution is direly needed. If you talk about it as a, a humanitarian pause, if it's an extended humanitarian pause, can't amount to a ceasefire, that's okay. Whatever terminology you want to use, but we can have a, a few hours and then again have, you know, the continued uh, just senseless bombing uh, of these innocent civilians. Now, while Israel's Netanyahu is not alone in pursuing strong man violence in order to preserve his own political position, he was, you know, indicted for corruption. Uh, you know, he's he's got issues domestically in his judicial reform, and yet the the characteristics of authoritarianism, like strong and violence, that he's illustrated, uh, they're common in a lot of other countries. I won't mention any countries' names, <laughs> right? But you've also got a technique of dividing and conquering, which he pursued, and that other populist nationalists pursue, rather than good leadership that unifies rather than divides undermining democratic rights, attacking institutions like the free press, the independent judiciary as he did in Israel, but that's happening all around the world. Scapegoating minorities, as you mentioned, right? Uh, and violating human rights, basically. So these, these are the authoritarian playbook. Um, we're seeing worldwide regression of human rights. This is amazing. I was there when the Berlin Wall fell. I happened to be in Berlin for a conference and it was a joyous time, but now, Democracy and human rights have addressed to the point before the fall of the Berlin Wall. Is that for me? Conclude, yeah. Conclude. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I'll conclude. Um, the point is that 72% of the world now lives under torture, according to a recent study. So I'll just say a quick word about artificial intelligence. It's about to make everything much worse, mainly because it empowers not only privacy invasions, but an unbelievable low cost. Uh, ability to have misinformation at a much greater scale than we've had, deep fake images, videos. Already we've had foreign influence, in, interference, domestic interference in elections across the world, across the world. And so those human rights violations will continue. Generative AI has great powerful positive applications, but it also raises you know, serious threats, including uh, new existential threats, you know, the ability to find out easily how to make bombs and uh, weapons of mass destruction, bioweapons, and so forth. So it's good now that we have governance efforts on that. You know, there's a new AI directive in the in the U.S. that um, OICD, in collaboration with a lot of other people, had a lot of efforts over the last years to build up to this that takes a human rights risk management approach, and that's what we need. You know, U.S. has a uh, market-based approach. Chinese has a dystopian authoritarian approach. 
Europe has actually got the best approach, which is looking at the risks from these new technologies like artificial intelligence and trying to make them rights compliant, right? So that's uh, that's all I'll say. Identity, identity affecting technologies can be both part of the problem and the solution, depending on how we collectively design and regulate them. Entrepreneurs, female entrepreneurs need to do this. So let's ensure we're doing it the right way to advance peace and understanding instead of the contrary. Thank you for your patience. Do we have time for a question here? Or yeah, not? we have a little bit of time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I just don't want to to move too much. Yeah, we don't have a lot of time, but we can have some questions. Yeah. Uh, does somebody want to ask any questions? Okay, Bruce. Yeah. Just, just very good. Um, the history of the development of the, the, the um, Convention on Human Rights, uh, as I remember, I think there were people, anthropologists, and, and others, like yes. uh, the Vice Charles, um, turned up right, and gave a talk. Absolutely. So, yeah. Do you remember some of those debates? Uh, the, the study of that period and, and how yes, it was yes. encoded in. in, in it is, and there's some great books in the history, but anthropologists played a bad role because of their commitment to cultural relativism. But ultimately, you know, and now the various anthropological associations across the world have endorsed the principle of universal rights, right? So indigenous people need <laughs> respect to, obviously. And so I think that they, you know, we've got a lot of agreement now of the objective nature of the human rights. There are, of course, critiques, and I've read them, but I think that their practical value, if you really study them, their ability to bring a lens of understanding, of listening to others, respecting them, treating them with dignity, it really does advance a lot of important pro-social goals like security, prosperity, thriving, economic development, and peace. Right? So it's, it's sort of hard to argue with that. <laughs> It's interesting to me that identity and culture was kind of encoded originally in the, in the human rights agenda. It was. And, and, and we kind of think of it now as it's it's still on the place of identity and culture, but it's, it's actually a primary discourse. It's, still there. it's like the framework of the Bill of Rights in the US. You have you know, the, the First Amendment, which is my favorite, has six different freedoms in it against establishment of religion, but for freedom of religion. It's got free press, free expression, freedom of assembly, the right to petition the government for redress of grievance. These are process-based rights that can be a safety valve. As JFK said, if you don't have peaceful evolution, you'll have violent revolution. So identity is very much still, as I mentioned, it's in literally the names of a lot of the treaties, these various identities, plus none of them can be discriminated against. And there's protection for vulnerable people above all, right? Because they're most at risk, especially in times of war. But, um, there are also explicit protections for cultural, uh, and it's become much more important with indigenous peoples. All peoples, including indigenous, have a right to self-determination, preservation of their culture. That's what the new Declaration of Indigenous says, but it's also right there in the Universal Declaration and especially the International Covenant on Economic and Social Cultural Rights. So this is the beautiful thing. You know, it's kind of confusing, but we want pluralism. We, as we say in the US, Robert Jackson, who was also not a Supreme Court justice only, he was the chief prosecutor at Nuremberg for Nazi war crimes after World War II. And he said, if there's any fixed star in the Constitution's, uh, the constellation of our Constitution, it's that no orthodoxy shall be imposed. Uh, and that's true. If you have this sort of repression, that's what autocrats want. They want to criminalize dissent. As we were discussing in coffee break, several states have now outlawed diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative. That's why you can't hire on the basis of that right now. Hiring is not a solution of diverse people in these states. And the Supreme Court of the United States and a lot of other people in this, uh, you know, the sort of, it's a pretty extremist uh, <laughs> right-wing uh, authoritarian playbook on one party of you. It's explicitly anti-democracy, explicitly embracing violence. We're having mass shootings on an almost daily basis. I don't mean to you know, to cast it as a catastrophe, but it's quite disturbing. You know, there are, it's really a question that we're on a nice edge of saying, are we gonna have the values that we've always had toward a more union, or are we going to uh, capitulate? As you're seeing in a lot of, you know, the alternative for, for, for Germany, right, that party, 
Giorgio Maloney's party uh, in Italy, the Brothers of Italy, the uh, the Swedish, ironically named Democrat party. And you can go through that, Victor Orban in Hungary. I mean, you have these parties with fascist leanings throughout Europe. You know, the, the, the narrow election in Poland was a big victory, I think, for the forces of of light and tolerance and, and pluralism and peace, frankly. But if you take control of the media, if you take control of the independent judiciary, as Victor Orban has done, you know, it's very problematic for not just relations with the EU, but uh, you know, for, for peace and security of the sort that was a rationale forming the EU. Yeah, I have a question, yeah. Please. So actually I have a lot of questions, but I'm going to try to be closer. Okay. So one of the things, uh, I'm not a lawyer, um, but I'm a political scientist. So one of the things that have always puzzled me in a sense is that uh, I feel like human rights, uh, uh, all, all human rights are based on identity and specifically national identity in terms of enforcement. Yeah. So um, in the sense, it's not a positive way of being connected to of having an identity bias because this means that if you have no national identity, then you lack protection. And this is what happens in Israel Palestine clearly because you have no state to protect people and the states that should be protecting people because it's an occupying uh, power obviously does not because it's an occupying power. So right, right. Uh, this is the type of contradiction in terms of the, um, the difference between being universalist in discourse and then uh, being clearly exclusionary in terms of nationality and being part of a nation state and modern nation state system in terms of enforcement. Yeah. So my first question would be, uh, how much do you feel that uh, uh, international humanitarian law has evolved uh, in the sense of, of dealing with those kinds of situations? Uh, and what are the possibilities of surpassing that? And then I have another question, which is, not necessarily related, uh, but this is something that has been following me a lot. Uh, as you know, I said, it's around for sign, uh, and uh, people have been asking me a lot about, or talking a lot uh, in the media about humanitarian international law putting the same uh, weight in all belligerent parties to protect civilians. So it doesn't matter if you're a state, if you're a militia, whatever you are, uh, you must comply to the same international humanitarian law and international conventions in terms of protecting civilians. But then it comes to me always the, the question, which is uh, if we call Hamas a terrorist organization, say that Hamas has the obligation to protect people, and if they don't, it's their fault because, just like you said, obviously it doesn't work, right? But just like you said, uh, they're using people as human shields, they're uh, hiding them all hospitals, and everything. Uh, then for me, it seems like uh, humanitarian international law is just becoming a way for the uh, Israeli government to use uh, somehow uh, some sort of shield to protect itself from protecting. Because then when Israel does this use humanitarian international law, it'll say, yeah, uh, I can do my part, but then Hamas needs to do its part. Mm -hmm. And if Hamas is not doing it, then this part is not my fault. So it's reversing the, the yeah. discourse of human rights. And this is something that for me is puzzling. So it's uh, uh, I've read everything in the past weeks, and it seems to me that, that this is precisely what Britain over there. So Hamas has the same right of a state which is established, have time treatment, have uh, rights, obligations, and uh, benefits of being part of an international community. Uh, so Israel has the same uh, obligations right. under international law of course. Okay, well, the, those are so very English, ex English. excellent questions, and I'll answer the, the latter one first, or try. It's also an analogous to an area I work in a lot, which is business and human rights. You know, in addition to being an avocational and full-time academic throughout my adult life, I was also, you know, dipping into uh, corporate law and international law and helping corporations uh, expand globally. And luckily, I was working with some pretty green ethical corporations. That wasn't a huge issue, although uh, one of them did make some surveillance equipment. So we had an issue there. But that's a non-governmental organization. It's a non-state actor. And it, too, needs to comply increasingly, according to you, in guiding principles and business and human rights with international expectations, norms of human rights. 
Hamas, and, and the law is quite clear on this, you know, Hamas is violating international law when it lo uses human you know, it locates in civilian populations. They defend it as a practical mechanism, a matter of, you know, necessary sort of guerrilla warfare in order to accomplish their aims because they don't have the power of the state. But it's revealing, extremely revealing. It's the homage, as Rosh Bakul said, that, that vice pays to virtue, that they deny that they killed any civilians. On my way here, my Palestinian driver, he said, no, no, that's all misinformation, deep fakes. No civilians were killed by Hamas on October 7th. And my Israeli phone, uh, friends, you know, they similarly, uh, you know, they, they have their own difficulties with recognizing Often Palestinians as human beings. I've heard some really racist things from some of my beloved Israeli friends that were subject to these attacks because of the the, the situation. Um, so the the law is evolving all the time. Specifically, and this is getting to your first question on the enforcement side. The enforcement, the most important enforcement, is at the national level. It's in domestic courts and agencies because that's closest to the people through the process of taking the human rights standards or say the ILO conventions protecting workers' rights, including 169 on indigenous peoples, and, you know, they're taking those into domestic jurisdictions and domestic courts can rule on them if they're educated and trained to do so, if they seize the opportunity. But that has happened all over the world, thousands of cases, right? Including in economic, social, cultural rights, you know, um, so that's important, but there are systems at the regions, the European system of human rights, the inter-American system of human rights. They all have their pluses and minuses, and they all have backlogs, sadly, sometimes multi-year backlogs. But they also do good work, because ultimately this is about, ultimately, it's about the holy grail of culture. It's norms. It's how people act in practice. The law is part of that. The rulings that give penalties or the legislation that sets up carrots and sticks but ultimately, it's about what happens in the hearts and minds of people. And that's the Holy Grail. That's what all of us can change by starting to talk about these issues across polarized identity lines, which, again, as some said, isn't happening. People don't want to do it because it makes them uncomfortable. When your most important values and your comfort is questioned, that's especially when you need to do it. But you need to do it wisely and effectively. And that's, again, not starting off with your position, not arguing, not shaming. It's listening. It's being very respectful to that you know, uncle at the holiday table that's kind of crazy and saying all these wild things. Um, but then, you know, you do have at the UN, there's a periodic review of all the states over time. There's special rapporteurs, special procedures that can actually do country visits. There's a lot of human good work. So you've got the UN system and its enforcement. The Human Rights Council has not just prosecute, uh, you know, resolutions, but there's actually committees at the UN that that the Human Rights Committee for Civil and Political Rights, the Economic, Social, Cultural Rights, each of these major treaties, you know, for the most part, they have their committees and institutions. You can have confidential inquiries, you can have diplomatic approaches to get prisoners of conscious release. By the way, if you don't know, Amnesty International was inspired here. You may know Peter Bennett's and a British lawyer started Amnesty after he heard about two students here in Portugal that were imprisoned for seven years merely because they wrote, they, they, uh, they raised the post to liberty in a bar at the time of the dictator Salazar. That's, that's, you have that <laughs> to be, we're grateful to Portugal uh, for doing, and even prisoners of conscience included the former Portuguese president as far as, so, you know, the, that, that's a normative thing, naming and shaming. It works a little less if you have leaders that are less shamed, that are shameless, but it still works, right? You still want people because their ability to get concrete benefits like aid from the World Bank and so forth, depends on them not being pariah nations, right? And so there are a variety of enforcement mechanisms, but they are broader than just the domestic, and they're evolving all the time, including using new digital technologies like satellites, for example, right now in Gaza. Even when we couldn't get into Gaza, you could tell what was happening, even when the internet was out, because we could see what was happening on the ground. And then when the internet went back up, you know, which is, by the way, also a right, access to information, that's a human right. You could uh, give information. Yes. Just one thing. Okay. Uh, apologies. Let me just cut the moderator job. Yeah. Please keep it short and also okay. reach out. My answer. That's a lot of uh, okay. a lot of time. Sorry. Thank you. I'm sorry. Just 
very short question. Yeah. Like when it comes to human rights, but also if it comes to technology, I think like one thing that is shaping human rights even more than law is actually education. Because if I think about how identity concepts were being shaped over generations, like and I compare, for example, Iran with Palestine. Like I think one major factor that makes a difference is that Iranian women, for example, they got education and so they shape their identities of having it as a natural instinct to stand for their rights. So I just wanted to hear if you can confirm this argument or absolutely confirm it. And and LYC is at its core an or an educational organization, also you know, doing a lot of practical work, usually behind the scenes, as you'll hear more from our beloved founder, Bruce White, a little later. A lot of this involves subtextual communication. A lot of it has to be subtle because you can't you know, explicitly address the issues until people are ready to, be, to, to hear them, right? And so it's like diplomacy. To work, it has to be sometimes secretive. It has to be very subtle and delicate. Um, but you know, there have been like amnesty here in Portugal over the decades since it was founded, we've got hundreds of political prisoners of conscience released. And that's just in Portugal, it's happened all over the world. And Amnesty's complemented its methods with a lot of other you know, high tech uh, digital surveillance methods. They have a cyber lab that confirmed that I and a lot of others were spied on by some of these bad state actors that are trying to sow division in the West you know, and funding some of these radical right-wing extremist quasi-fascist politicians around the world. So uh, I, that's my answer. I'll keep it short, and we can talk more at the, the next coffee break. Yeah, thank, thank you again you for your patience. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, so that we can move on for our last uh, session. Good morning. We're going to hear Tafel uh, Fato, this is Tafel Fato, the uh, Chief Investment Officer in the Investment Management. By incorporating changing identity by factors into economic development, public private, and corporate public investment policy. Is it? Yeah. Thank you. I'm just changing I can move barrels, right? No, we can stay here. I will stay here, but I think I want to stand up. So, when people think about humanity's biggest achievement of the last 20 years, they always think of technological advancements like the uh, development of the smartphone or artificial intelligence. But I will argue that humanity's biggest uh, achievement has been the billions of people we pulled out of poverty more than at any time in human history. 1.3 billion in the top five emerging markets alone this has been done through a tried and tested development policy. You take people from their villages and move them to cities in high productivity sectors where they can uh, gain access to education, healthcare, um, financial inclusion, and still dreaming of more and better for their families. I believe that humanity's biggest challenge this century is to meet the needs of all within the boundaries of our planet. The donut model gives a holistic picture of this challenge. The outer circle is comprised of the planetary boundaries model. Earth system scientists Rockstrom and, uh, uh, and um, Matthias uh, uh, Stern, uh, he, they defined um, nine factors that if bridge would would, um, would have devastating impact on our planet. The donor brings an inner circle, which is the minimum social foundation to have an equitable, uh, an equitable planet. And the objective should be to try and get humanity into this green space, where we have a safe and just future for all. I want you to look at this inner circle, and the writing is small. But what I do with investing money, I start working at seven in the morning. So basically what I can do is I can address the needs for gender equality, housing, networks, energy, providing access to water, food, health, education, income and work. 
And at four o'clock, I go off work, and this is where OICD comes in. Peace and justice, political voice, social equity. These are aspects that no matter how much money we try to throw through investment, we cannot solve. And an organization like OICD, the work that most of you here are doing are addressing these factors and working together, we can try and shift humanity there. There, in investing, we refer to as ESG investing. We try to integrate the pro in our processes in four areas. In identifying opportunities of how we push through investment, people in this green space. Then we do this bottom-up analysis, which I'm not going to cover, in how we risk adjust the returns to consider all these factors. And then actively engaging with companies, with regulators, to bring positive change. And finally, how we measure ESG performance. In my research, I focus on five groups that I believe are seeing the biggest changes in their lives. The people at the bottom of the pyramid, migrants willing to uproot themselves and their families for a better future. Women, youth from disadvantaged communities within these countries, and older adults trying to extend their productive lives. I've done, since 2011, 28 studies across these emerging markets from drug trafficking villages in Mexico to fast-growing utilities in China through rural India. And we keep talking about ethnographic studies. Some of you might know what it looks like, but this is a typical setup where we're studying the lives of people within their community. And the objective here is we're, objecting, we're observing behavior, but we are trying to get to the underlying motivation, whether it's driven by cultural factors, social factors, or is it personal experience? And the last one is the least relevant because what points us to solutions and trends is the cultural and the social. And somebody asked before about biases. I am a product of the, my background. I have biases and I know that. And the way we try to address it in our team you will see here, we are transmitting, there is a translator there, and he's transmitting to the rest of the team. And always, we have a team of about seven observing. There's one or two people in the field. And therefore, when we work as a team, we can collectively get rid of our biases. I want you to give you an example of how this works. I want you to meet Mira. Mira was a yoga instructor, and in 2012, she was driving her scooter to the gym she worked where she was hit by, a, by a, a truck. She spent three months in the hospital, never worked in the, in the fitness industry again. Three years later, she identified this opportunity that women in modern India want to outsource celebration cooking. So she hired a widow and started spreading the word of her new business to Facebook and WhatsApp. The start was really hard and inefficient. She had uh, they had huge pots and they had to cook many batches, but she stuck with it. Within two years, she employed five widows and they, she was paying them about 200 euros each a month. Any money she got, she would invest in the business because nobody would lend her any money. Now, Mira doesn't run an NGO to empower widows. She identified two identity shifts in modern India that she was taking advantage of. One, that women didn't want to cook, spend the days cooking, and they wanted to outsource it. And second, the changing role of uh, widows in India, where traditionally their identities were supposed to end with the death of their husband. And she gave them employment and took them out of those repressive homes. Now, I meet hundreds through my study of women like her who started a silent revolution through their homes where they still do the traditional role and they create a business on the side which allows them to upgrade the family income. The problem is they're ignored by official statistics and they're ignored by the finance community. I've invested in microfinance all my life, but microfinance gives you love, maybe a hundred, maybe two thousand euros. She needs significant more capital. And when it comes to official banking, she doesn't have an employment or official records. So there is a gap. So my role in my research is to find these organizations and I engage with the banks to change their processes because with technology and fintech, we should be able to provide. And this would be transformational for the people um, uh, with, the, with these entrepreneurs in emerging markets. Now, we also try to study I, the change of identities longitudinally. So this is Sneha. Uh, uh, 2017 was the first time we studied her. She was a young woman trying to escape out of uh, the uh, Indian slums. She was an accounting graduate. We studied her life for six years. When she got her first job, 
It was all about security needs, uh, protecting her family, giving money to her parents, providing education for her brother. Uh, but as she left the slums, her identity started moving towards the sea. It was no longer good enough. There's a picture a year at her workplace. She was wearing, wearing the hand-me-down clothes from the family where her mother works as a maid. And now she's wearing, she's buying her own clothes. She's getting uh, her teeth straightened. And sometimes when we talk about consumer products, we view it as some consumerist, some evil, but it's an important medium that we communicate our changing identities. And, and, and she is already starting to behave in a higher sense economic group. And I find it very interesting. I thought, yes, education. She was a top student. She's going to kill everybody when she goes to work. And I was wrong. When I went to study her life a year, she still called me Sarah, even though she met me many times before. While the other women who were working from the higher socioeconomic groups they had this confidence. They were speaking to me as their equal. They behave in a different way. And they, these women need to shift their identity uh, in order to succeed. Um, when I go to people's home, I ask them to show me the pictures. And 30 years ago, people, when they traveled, they went to visit their grandparents in their hometowns of crowded trains. Now, there are tourists, they're with their friends, and they travel by plane. So I'm going to make you think that you're all investors, and I'm going to make you an investment proposition. You know what the package tour operating is, companies like TUI. Would you invest in a company to satisfy their travel needs? Anybody who would invest in a package tour operator, please your, lift your hand, left your hand. Again? Would you invest in a package tour operator that offers you visit six, 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 seven days? Okay. Anything, it doesn't matter. Would that be a good business to invest based on this? Who thinks a good business? Okay. So one of the things I learned uh, when I mean, we're doing ethnography, this is the most important stuff that archaeologists do better than investors. Investors who hear what is happening, which I just described to you, and we think we can predict what's going to happen next. But anthropologists always try to get to that line why, and I haven't given you the why. So why use a very simple framework I've adapted by, from a psychologist called Shalom Short, which looked at values and how they were shifting in 76 different countries. And I like this framework because it's very quick for me. And when I have to explain it to people, we all um, intuitively understand it because values is the invisible hand that makes us behave in a certain way. I think of it in four different quadrants. Values in the conservative quadrant, think of this in frontier markets, the values of our grandparents, think of the values of the military. You have to sacrifice yourself, yourself for the greater good of the group. And this group will come and protect you, but don't break one of their values because it's like breaking a taboo and you will be ostracized and left alone. Most of the markets I study sit in this quadrant where people try and focus on achievement, competition, and try to compete or do each other acquisition of status symbols, um, the, through grooming, education, uh, as they try to compete and outdo each other, basically. And then on the top left-hand quadrant, the individual is trying to compete against herself is uh, values of creativity, trying to continuously learn, become a better version of themselves, dictating their own agenda. And you move to the right, the values become collective again, and that you care about the environment, social justice. So the short in the studies of the 90s put the countries in different, in different places. And for me, what I find interesting in this discussion, United States firmly in that quadrant, but after September 11th, the values are shifting, shifting more into conservatives. And that's a process that has been taken uh, in the last 20 years. Um, I, we, I use this in everything. With everybody I communicate, the companies, I try to place people in their values. As an organization, we map our values uh, every two years. And it's really important because, as Sandra was saying, it starts to become a force of good. Because if you know where your values are, and somebody behaves in a different way, if you have clearly articulated them, you can have the discussions about that this moves against the values. Now, I asked a question about traveling. Let me give you a, a simple way to how to think about travel. When you are conservative, you will travel back to your hometown to be with your family. You almost never get on a plane. When you're competitive, you're going to travel in six cities in seven days. You're going to paste it on Facebook. Make sure everybody knows about every meal you're going to eat, host it. And, I'm sure we all know people like that. And then when you move to the top quadrants, travel for these people becomes a learning experience. I was studying the life of a woman who was spending an enormous amount of her 
of your personal expenditure of traveling and said to her, why are you doing this? And the answer she gave me was, you need to travel outside to journey within. So it's part of their growth journey. So value is very important in how, uh, in how we think about investments. Now, I want to move to active engagement. We actively engage with companies. I've got three, the first case studies with a company. This is a healthcare company in Africa, who started to move into vaccines. And we all talk about diversity, and the, there is diversity, which is gender and racial, which is so easy to spot. But for me, the most important thing we need is cognitive diversity. Because if you don't have cognitive diversity, you will not be able to grow. Think about this company. They, don't, they didn't have the right person who would be able to guide. If I was sitting as an independent there, and I don't have anybody with vaccines, can I trust throwing all this extra capital there? Um, and so cognitive diversity, very important. And we have to engage with them to try and find a new independent board member. On the other side, how you remunerate management is their scorecard. And if you're too slow, you don't create the right matrices, then we're not going to be able to deliver what we should in the right time frame. And here we engage with the, um, with the head of the remuneration committee. Now, think about this opportunity. These guys in Africa, got four vaccines from the Serum Institute of, Indi of India. They got the Gates Foundation, they gave them 30 or 40 million to change the production lines. If we do this right and we get the right KPIs, we can have a transformational change in healthcare outcomes in, in, in Africa. And that is why it's worth spending so much time engaging to make this right, because we can really have a big, a big change. Now, next thing, um, Collaborative engagements, uh, circular economy, quite a big thing. We joined the Lema Corsa Foundation and the WWF on circular economy. We studied emerging market uh, circularity. Somewhere along the line, we change our identities in emerging markets. Um, waste is a seed. And you see these guys, it's like a bag of as they call them in India. They will come and they buy anything from your home. Your old newspapers, plastics, they will take by cables and strip them, you can see them stripping the cables out. And, um, and we joined this thing uh, originally to make sure, uh, um, to make sure that, uh, the, that, uh, that we understood the direction the plastics were growing. But now, as in Nairobi, it was mandated to have an international committee to create a legally binding UN resolution for plastics. Uh, um, the Trinetra basically were basically lobbying for all these people. Uh, and um, yeah. Sorry, how many minutes have I? Sorry, it? it's like I'm, I'm like thinking, I'm like, yeah, I'm like, I lost it. Like, I'm just thinking, I thought I think it started. How many minutes do I have? Uh, as much as you want, but we have a right past 15. So, uh, past 15. Okay. okay, let me make sure how I'm having it. So, basically, in Nairobi, we have now a UN legally binding treaty. What we're doing, we're still engaged. Why we're still engaging? Because everything has become technical, but we're lobbying for these people. These people will lose their livelihood with the way the direction of this, uh, this industry because the people who will be able to treat plastic and buy public plastic will be big companies who will treat it the right way. And you need to make sure they're covered properly. Um, one of the things I will tell you, we're engaged with regulators. This is the regulator in the United Kingdom pay or on ESG. I just did a simple search. Climate 234 times mention, net zero, 126, social, 26. All the work we're all doing, this is how important it is for regulators. Why? Because these are easy to measure and it makes us feel good. But these are the hard things to measure and this is equally important because we need to get 4 billion people from the middle of the donut out. So how do we measure performance? SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, 17 goals voted by the United Nations as the blueprint for a sustainable and equitable future. The way we do it, we try to have measurable goals to go um, to, uh, to measure against, and you have to have key indicators. We also measure the negative impact of every investment against these SDGs. And I'm gonna skip and show you the, sim the simple danger if you have single measures. This is from, um, from, uh, from Brazil. There is a city called Tabadinga, which is uh, on the border between Brazil, Peru, and, and Colombia. And um, I want to make the case for airlines. A lot of people don't want to touch an airline 
that they could do that. But this city, um, the only way they could go to Manaus, which is over a thousand kilometers, used to be on a six hour boat ride uh, upstream and four, down, four days downstream. Sorry, six days with four. And then Azul, a local budget airline, came and put a flight that takes one hour, 45 minutes. Azul flies 80% of these routes, is the only airline that flies these, these routes. And this allows people to develop within their communities as opposed to moving and causing congestion in polluted cities. Now, when it comes to measuring pollution of airlines, everybody measures them against carbon intensity. And if you look at it, actually, airline one is Azul, 77 grams versus 68, it appears as a bigger polluter. But the reason it's polluting more is because it's flying uh, smaller airlines on this thin route. If I compare them on the thick routes, the busy routes, actually, it's flying the newer planes. So it's actually a much better airline for this one. So everybody is looking at the wrong measure when they're looking at the airlines. And if I go and actively check, ask them to reduce their intensity, they're going to cut the routes that we want them for the economic development. So the way we measure airlines, we look at the percentage of your fleet that is the latest generation. And uh, uh, three years ago, 55% of their planes used to be all the uh, uh, used to be the, late, the older generation. Now, 25% only is the older generation. Now, I'm going to stop. Uh, I'm going to stop here because I don't want to run out of time and take any questions. So, uh, I'm opening the floor. Thank you very much. So, who wants to, to begin? Questions? Um, just for the purposes of uh, um, Sort of fleshing out the uh, yeah, ESP, um, and it might be interesting to um, sort of look at economic social governance criteria and just give a very quick uh, briefing on how important it is to uh, economic development more generally and why it's such uh, an important uh, initiative to start getting the measurements right. Yeah, because it's absolutely, uh, absolutely right. And we need to, if we don't have the right measurements, as I'm trying to show here. We are doing the wrong actions. If you see now, everybody goes and signs off on these net zero initiatives. Now, everybody gets excited, and I'm refusing to accept to sign any net zero initiative. Why? Number one, they're uh, designed for the developed world. Uh, when you measure, and I hear people saying, oh, emerging markets, India, China are the most polluting. Yes, but you're, are you measuring the pollution they, that they're generating in the country? What about based on a consumption basis? Because a lot of the things they, they generate come from the developing world. Well, how it come in India is so polluting? Are you calculating on a per capita basis? Because all of a sudden, if you do it on a per head, it becomes like tiny. And China and, and US are the same level of, uh, of pollution. It's not true on a per capita basis when you divide it by the population. U.S. is extremely more polluting. So these things are not designed. And my concern what, with how people are behaving with their own measures is they're going to divest. And we're going to leave these emerging markets out. And if we don't invest in them, the targets will go completely the wrong way. And without helping on the social factors, you will never have environmental sustainability unless you deal with the social aspects in these countries. On uh, just a little follow-up to that, to what extent, if any, does your social dimension include human rights? For me, uh, the human rights, there is a simple things to do, right? Every organization, and, and I don't like the, the, that it's this way, but we tick blocks, right? Do you have a human rights policy in a company? Yes, okay, we tick the box, and they can put a policy. For me, and I, I want, I try to take the research to one more level, and I'll show you the slide that I didn't get to. For example, um, we've got this, this pilot we're doing with Cambridge University, we've got a PhD student who is uh, working in, in Mexico, in Mexico City at the moment. So um, he's in an underprivileged community of transportation workers. So what we're trying to understand is from another angle, how are these people treated? What is the impact from moving, from owning your own in the formal economy to move to the formal? What is the loss of identity you, are, you will have? 
can I engage with the company to stop that? And I have, we are not focusing now only on transportation, the objective, we have a, a fast food company that we're investing in, it has 70,000 workers. Now, the insights I can take from there and going and engaging with the company and trying to bring those changes coming from the people, of course, that's when it's powerful. I can tell you that every single code company has a diversity and inclusion, but everyone has a human rights policy. The question is, how do you know it's true? And the only way is to come the other way from me. And they take it actually to one more level of that. Have I saved you now time to catch up on lunch? <laughs> Almost. Uh, anybody has any other question? So, you mentioned the, the woman who continued to call you sir and you're a deferential. Um, well, this is very common in South Asia. Yeah. And one of the things you see is it's not so much that she would shed that, it's that she would then um, adopt a hierarchical position, a new identity, and she would expect to be called madam by those below her. So you're not shedding rid of the hierarchy just because she might be more you know, relaxed with you and treat you as a collateral. Uh, how do you how do you address those kind of hierarchical identities that are in some places really suppressing the potential talent they might tap into? I don't know. I mean, it, it's interesting, but I haven't been able to see her share that, that that yet. I find it very, you know, I had such a view before. I would say, oh, these people, it's all about education. And uh, I remember when she started working, she 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 was saving all this money to do an MBA. She thought if she did an MBA, she would belong there. And I can tell you, I have seen, and I don't want to sound patronizing when I say this, but in India, you see them when they have, and I'm sure it's the same Pakistan, they have the oil, hair oil, they put on their hair, and it, it, it signifies that, you know, tradition. But I have met women in the workplace who, who tell me shampoo, it was their big moment because all of a sudden they give a certain signal at work. They do, it allows them to have volume and do hairstyles. And they believe that I'm not only, I am a modern woman, but I can tell everybody and show everybody I'm a modern woman. So there is all these nuances that for me, I mean, I find them fascinating, fascinating that it's like, do you mean that a shampoo can have a bigger impact on your career than having an MBA? So yeah, it's a different way to think about things, I guess, but yes. But there's something in between, like you mentioned, everything can be solved with fintech and technology. But what if you give, I run hackathons myself, so what if you give people fintech and technology, but you don't explain them how to create an entrepreneurial system yeah. and how to use the technology, then it's going to waste. So I think in between what you mentioned, there is still something, another dimension, right? There is, and let me tell you this aspect of fintech and technology, I've been super disappointed. If you look at India, the UPI system, they pay, uh, uh, it's a government system, it's, the transactions are basically cost nothing, it's not like us paying through Visa or MasterCard. So she, these women, uh, I have so many cases, they pay through Google Pay, they can build a credit profile, and therefore the banks should be able to create a credit profile very easily because they pay the widows through GPay, they got paid through that, let's build a credit profile. But the banks have been arguing since 2017 are too lazy, too slow. They're too sclerotic because they're making too much money in other things. They focus on the richer people. So we need some disruption, but it's not. There is a lot of also um, fighting to stop fintech by the existing players to get the regulator worried about, oh, if this happens, we become a financial crisis, and it slows the progression of fintech in these in this countries. So even though it has the power, it's not delivering it at this stage. Okay, so thank you very much, Dr. Uh, so we're going to have a, a short break for lunch. Uh, we're coming back here at 2 so that we can try to, to keep up on the uh, afternoon schedule. So I hope to see you all uh, in the afternoon. Thank you.